Well, hello everyone. Welcome back to yet another installment of Ella Teaches English. Today's episode is going to be either really enlightening, life changing, or very controversial, or both. So buckle up, you're in for a good one. First off, I just want to say thank you for the new subscribers, particularly on YouTube. I have never seen so many comments and it makes you feel like I'm developing a, a fan base rather than just going off virality here and there. So shout out to the new followers on, on different platforms, but particularly on YouTube. Another heads up is that I will probably be looking at my phone just because I wrote down a lot of notes and I cannot for the life of me memorize every single thing. I want to break this video down to the first segment why I want to talk about this subject, why it's important to talk about it. And the second segment is how, how it came to be, how this phenomenon came to be. And the third segment is how to solve them, how to systematically solve them. I'm going to give you some guidelines so you can tackle this project systematically. And then some shortcuts. For those of you who are impatient, just like myself. The first segment, the reason I want to talk about this subject is that this phenomenon is quite common. It's a lot more common than you think. Most everybody I interact with, uh, either online or offline, most students I have, have either studied abroad and are currently back living uh, in their home country, or they're still currently going through it. And a lot of people's knee-jerk reaction to that statement might be, oh, they're not actual students. They're just here for a good time. They don't study hard enough. When in reality, I have a lot of students getting their master's degree, doing their PhD, or have graduated and are currently working. So these are intelligent, smart, and successful people. So when I say that this phenomenon is not just a one-off event, I'm hoping that it, it has a little bit weight to it. And for those of you who are currently going through it, that might be feeling a little embarrassed or ashamed about it, don't feel this bad because I, I assure you, it's most of the time not your fault. The system failed you, okay? The schooling system you had before prior to studying abroad really failed you. The teachers that taught you English are gonna struggle just as much, if not more, living in a, a brand new environment or talking to foreigners. Another reason that I want to talk about Kouyu is that it's quite an elusive concept in that it looks different in every case. Kouyu can look different in 10 different people. Some people might be struggling with their pronunciation. Some people might be struggling with their active vocab, the amount of words that they know how to say, how to write. Some people, they might need to work on grammar. So it looks different in in every single case. There's no one size fits all solution. And for this reason, I highly recommend either buy a self-study guide. My self-study guide has a questionnaire in the beginning so you can kind of deduce what's really going on with your English proficiency, which, with your English fluency, or ideally if you can afford it to book a consultation with me. That one consultation is going to give you clear guidance. It's going to give you a very clear compass as to where to go next. So you won't be doing a lot of guesswork, you won't be wasting a lot of time and money on doing things that don't work. So, but that's beside the point. Let's talk about how this phenomenon came about in the beginning. Because I've talked to so many students, uh, they've had the same experience, they've told me the same situation. I've, I've sort of condensed it down to before most students went abroad, they've never taken a course or systematically studied a body of language input that gradually progressed in difficulty, that incrementally increased in vocab, both in terms of quantity and in terms of quality. Perhaps quality trumps quantity because a lot of people have studied textbooks in school. But I just want to point out, first of all, the textbooks that you study in school are either written by Chinese people or Chinese people and British American people. It's a mixture. It's not, it's never authentic English. And Chinese textbooks specifically emphasize real life words, okay? Words that you can touch, words that you can put into a picture was that you can translate directly into Chinese. And then somehow learning English, the process of learning English, will it gradually evolve into identifying objects, identifying how to say certain objects in English. So books, tables, lights, uh, I'm just pointing out what I'm looking at right now. So when our main or sometimes only source of input is those textbooks, you don't end up learning a lot of 
abstract words. You don't learn a lot of sentence structures. You don't know how to put words together. Also, you underestimate how fluent and how proficient a native speaker is and how well they know certain words, how versatile these vocab actually are when native speakers use them. And then on top of that, because most people need to score really high in TOEFL or IELTS in a short amount of time, they almost always spend all their time doing routine exercises, memorizing vocab by rote that takes up all their energy, all their time that by the end of it, they're just exhausted. They don't even have the time or energy to do anything else and that continues on even after they came here you know you're you're instantly overwhelmed by schoolwork you're overwhelmed by life trying to survive trying to get by you don't even have time to uh, take care of yourself a lot of times and so the the problem of improving spoken english improving your english communication kind of gets put on the back burner and by the time people realize that that is an issue and they need to work on it enough time has passed a lot of people just assume that their english is good and oftentimes they themselves can even outwardly say it out loud i mean they come to me but with people in their life they don't admit it or they they admit it but they still don't have a solution for it and speaking of which i know how i come across uh, uh, speaking on this particular issue and I've alluded to this phenomenon before too and people have pointed out that I sound sarcastic or blasé or callous like I'm judging people like I put myself on the higher pedestal than than people that are struggling when in reality I know my tone can be a bit straightforward for a lack of a better term I know I can be a bit blunt but I mean no disrespect I like I said it's the system that failed you okay and it's a system that I would have been in just as you are currently in or were in. Tangent over, now back to reason number one. Before most people come abroad to study, they have never taken a look at how native speakers use their language. They've never picked a body of conversational textbooks. They've never emphasized the words that native speakers use on a daily basis. By the way, I'm going to allude to this group of words in a little bit because most of their time is spent on memorizing a lot of academic words that have some importance to them, of course, but are not as common, are not as versatile in daily conversations. So these are words that you would typically see in a college textbook or when you're preparing for IFO or TOEFL or Duolingo tests, like language tests. But when it comes to daily casual conversation, either in terms of speaking or in terms of un just passively understanding other people, you need to not only know the Chinese translation of sometimes simpler words, but you also need to know the different definitions of these common words. And that's what a lot of people lack. So. To summarize, the pipeline goes, when you don't have a body of work to study every single day, when you don't have a body of input to study every single day consistently, when you don't have key vocab, when you don't have quality vocab, then of course, as a result, you're going to have trouble understanding other people or understanding people accurately and fast enough. And then, of course, you're going to have trouble speaking or speaking exactly what you want to express. That's another issue, too, because my students are highly intelligent. They are highly eloquent in Chinese. Of course, they're going to want to sound just as smart, just as eloquent in English, right? But a lot of people's problems are not necessarily that they don't know how to speak at all. A lot of times it's that they don't know how to fluently, efficiently, and accurately express themselves. And it makes them feel stupid when they really are not. Reason number two is that they don't have enough tools and guides or reference books, one of which is a dictionary, a proper comprehensive dictionary that doesn't just translate the word into Chinese, especially when it comes to abstract words, abstract words that are really common in day-to-day -day life. You can't just get by with Yodao or Baidu Fanyi or Google Fanyi. I know a lot of people use Google Translate and, and use even Google Dictionary, but that's still not enough, okay? Maybe when it comes to academic words, a lot of words that already just have one or two different meanings, that you can use Google translation, Google dictionary, whatever. 
But when it comes to go, get, take, hang, words that are within that 3,000 range, maybe even 1,000 range, you really need a comprehensive dictionary to break each definition down and give you different phrases, different sentences. So when you don't have a proper dictionary word, when you have one, but you don't prioritize using it, then it's a biggie, okay? Because when speaking, you need to be certain. You need to know how to construct a sentence. And when you don't have that understanding, when you don't have that certainty, of course, you're going to speak really slowly. So if you want to find out what this dictionary is, how to use it, what it does, why it's so important, what are some alternatives for those of you who don't know how to use an English monolingual dictionary, then watch this video. I'm sure you can find it really easy it's one of my viral videos go right ahead speaking of tools and reference books i have some that will help you improve your english in a short relatively short amount of time that are not necessarily dealing with your systematic learning process but it will give you a confidence boost it will help like you'll you'll see a difference right away almost right away at least and now we're moving on to segment number three how to solve this problem and what are some shortcuts solution number one is to redefine spoken english and find out what the key problem is for yourself Remember how we said in the beginning that spoken English is quite an elusive problem? For some, it could be that their pronunciation is a bit off. And for others, it could be that they lack active vocab, active versatile vocabulary. And so I like to officially define spoken English as an instantaneous improvised verbal writing usually done in a spontaneous conversation, the performance of which depends on your level of understanding uh, of grammar and vocabulary, which, like I said, revolves heavily around the most common 3,000 words. In day-to-day -day conversations, it most of the time, it doesn't surpass this range. It doesn't have to be just these words. But I say first, learn how to walk, learn how to utilize these key, crucial, common vocab, and then learn how to walk faster, slightly faster. After you redefine your spoken English as this, as a verbal output that hinges on your vocab, hinges on your grammar, you can then break your English proficiency down to three key elements, namely pronunciation, grammar, and vocab. And for all intents and purposes, I like to suggest that you work on the first two elements first, because not only do these two elements seep into every single aspect, every single skill of English, be it writing, reading, listening, uh, what's the other one? speaking and at the same time there's a cap to it meaning that 发音学习和语法学习到一定程度就没有新的知识了它不可能今天是四十八个音标明天变成一百四十八个音标今天是四十个假设语法知识点明天不可能又多出来一些语法知识点对吧它学到一定程度的时候是会有一个结束点是可以
，就是磨刀不误砍柴工。也是走捷径的一个方法。And then solution number two, according to my notes, is that ideally you should get to the vocab stage as soon as you can. Okay, work on your pronunciation and grammar in less than two weeks or less than a month. I actually have courses dedicated to these two elements. And then once you're in the vocab stage, limit the words you study to the three thousand range. I've reiterated this concept so many times in this video already and in the past videos. So the key word is when it comes to studying these words is mastering, and not just knowing. So how do you master these words? First, you need to get a good dictionary, have a comprehensive dictionary that explains that actually breaks these words down to different usage, to different scenarios, to different definitions and meanings, and gives you. Sentences gives you phrases that you can replicate, that you can mimic in your day-to-day -day life,、um, and then stop reading every single article, every single language input that varies in vocab range. This is honestly really unfortunate because I talk about input, I talk about the importance of input, and so do so many other language creators, but. What they fail to acknowledge is that not every single piece of input is equal for beginners, at least. And so, a lot of times, I have people that have the best intentions. They they study everything from TED Talks to American TV shows to movies to English textbooks to 原著 to BBC, CNN, or news broadcast materials. And these not only vary in vocab range, they also vary in.、Um, The region of the English, right? When you watch BBC and CNN at the same time, these expressions don't fully overlap, especially when it comes to verbal common expressions, daily spoken English. The further two different countries are from each other, the the more likely they'll be speaking different expressions. So in the beginning, you want to limit your input down to a range of vocab, be it three thousand or four thousand, and then limit limit it to one. Region, so don't watch British English materials and then American English materials because, particularly for beginners, if you're also struggling with pronunciation, it might get murky. The difference between the two、it、might get murky, and what could be correct in British English might be totally lost on American people. And then finally, some shortcuts and some shortcut material for you to study or do exercise on.、Um, number one, like I said, study pronunciation, particularly 连读 liaison connection of speech and grammar systematically. I'll probably make another video dedicated to these two elements. There is a more efficient way to approach these two elements, and a slightly less efficient way. And unfortunately, most people are doing the slightly less efficient way. Number two is to buy. Phrasal verbs and use, or by any textbook or reference book with the phrase phrasal verbs, because a lot of people, a lot of native speakers, love phrasal verbs. When they can say "go about something," they wouldn't say "approach." When they can say "how did this come about," they wouldn't say "how did this happen." Basically, native speakers, as I've noticed, like to use shorter words. They like to use. One-syllable verbs with an adverb or a preposition, and that combination is called phrasal verb. In the Lamen dictionary, you get explanation of these phrasal verbs, but sometimes they can get tedious. They are arranged by words and not by common scenario. So if you get a phrasal verb dictionary or a phrasal verb reference book, and a lot of times you can learn it and apply it right away, almost the next day. And so yeah. That's a great resource. In addition to the dictionary, in addition to whatever you're reading as your main input, be it、uh, Meiji or conversational textbook. Okay, another additional resource is conversational American English. So this book is what I like to call 白假话或者白人客套说的话，白人假惺惺会说的话。它是把这些无意者会说的一些客套话。都按照这个不同的情景，按照不同的场合来分类。这样的话，比如说你今天要有一个重大的场合或者很正式的场合，你想要提前预习一下有哪些台词是你可以说的，那么你就可以用这个呃、uh, conversational American English。但这个不能作为你主要的语料，因为它没有一个对话，没有上下文，它只是会把。所有这个单个人会说的这个台词都列举出来了，所以就是临时抱佛脚的时候可以用 ，but 
in the long run, it's not gonna do. It's not gonna revolutionize your spoken English. You still need to study a body of textbook or、uh, language material and use a proper dictionary to understand these common words. But if you just want to have a few one-liners to impress your friends, to impress your boss, to not feel as nervous or self-conscious in a Big high stakes scenario, then go have fun, enjoy it. All right. With all that said, that is it for today's video. I hope I didn't offend anyone.、Uh, my intention is to console people if you're currently struggling with this problem,、um, and offer you some just guidelines, offer you a blueprint if you are trying to solve this problem, and、uh, to put it out in the ether that this problem is a lot more common. Then you might think there's nothing wrong with the people themselves. The issue lies with the system that taught us that, the the schools that taught us that. I don't know if I could say that without getting into trouble, but I mean I didn't benefit much from that system of teaching English. But that's another topic for another day. All right, thank you guys for watching. I'll see you in hopefully another video very soon. Bye.